Well, here we are, another Wednesday night on the new Fly Fisher Live. Welcome, everybody. My name is Mark Melnick. In the uh, lockdown that is Toronto, Ontario, Canada, welcome to the live show tonight. We've got a very special guest, um, one of uh, the most fishy people I've ever met, had the opportunity to work with. Uh, Brian Barry is his name. He is the uh, co-owner with his lovely wife, Jocelle, of Teton Valley Lodge in Yellowstone Teton Territory, just outside of Driggs, Idaho. Without further ado, let's get to the new Fly Fisher Live. Ooh, that's a nice size fish. I will catch these all day. That is what you're in for on this episode. Brian, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me, Mark. Hey, I know it's your time off. I know it's the winter time and things are uh, things are quiet in Driggs, Idaho right now. So I really appreciate the time that you're uh, you're spending with us tonight to uh, to talk about Teton Valley Lodge, uh, the rivers you fish, and uh, and the species you can catch out of your fantastic place. Hey, yeah, well, we appreciate you having us on, and uh, it was great having you guys out here and. Uh, hosting you guys and doing the, the, the video with it turned out great. And it's, yeah. Uh, so, so what Brian's talking about is we have, what Brian's talking about is we've got an episode of the new fly fisher airing on YouTube this Saturday at 12 noon Eastern time, 10 o'clock mountain time, 10 AM mountain time on Saturday that highlights it's the extended play version. It's the long version of our adventure with Teton Valley Lodge. We were uh, guided by Chris Scott, who is one of the fishiest guys I've ever had the opportunity to fish with. And uh, we just, we, oh my gosh. I mean, if you could see, I've got goosebumps just thinking about it. It was an absolutely fantastic trip. What I'd like to do is, Brian, if you don't mind, is I'd like to show a little bit of a highlight of our time here. Is that cool? Yeah, for sure, man. Awesome. The cool thing about that was that every day that we fished with you, which was five days straight, was full of special moments like that. Let's let's go through a little bit about what Teton Valley Lodge is all about and what you have to offer. All right, cool. Well, first, just watching that video, boy, that makes me miss summer. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that looked really good. Uh, so Teton Valley Lodge, I'm uh, 
currently, uh, my wife and I currently own the lodge and, uh, it's uh, been in our family for a really long time. It started out back in, uh, 1919, my great grandpa started guiding here in Teton Valley. He was born here. Uh, his parents immigrated here from Switzerland and, uh, they were, uh, pioneers and, and settled in the valley and, and uh, he started guiding when he was younger. People would, uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of a cool way he started doing it. He, uh, there used to be a train, the train used to come to Teton Valley. And uh, back when, when Yellowstone got going, uh, the park, uh, people would come out and take the train to Yellowstone. And uh, one of the ways that they would, would come or leave Yellowstone as they'd come out of Jackson, which is the east entrance, and uh, come over the hill to get on the train to go home, which was in Victor, Idaho, which is just about 10 miles to the south of us, is right. uh, the closest train where people get on it to head out. And uh, he figured out that uh, those tourists like to go fishing and uh, needed a guide, so he started guiding people. And then uh, built that up and finally built the lodge here in uh, 1938. And then um, uh, just kept it going for a long time. My dad started guiding for him when he was a little kid. My mom worked here uh, cleaning cabins and serving meals. And then uh, my dad uh, became really good friends with another fellow named John Pearson. And they guided together, started when they were little kids. They, back then, they would start guiding when they were 12, 13 years old. And... Uh, they guided and uh, became really good guides over the years, and then finally were able to buy the lodge. And uh, so, and then I was born here, raised here, and uh, eventually was able to take it over uh, and uh, live live here. And I, I'm just like the luckiest guy in the world to be able to live here and guide and live in a beautiful place. And we live in one of the fishiest places on earth. And uh, that's really one of the keys to our success is we just live in a great spot. Yeah, one of the one of the things that amazed me when we did our our show interview was that you actually said to me that you know you you're still discovering places to fish in in your region in Yellowstone Teton territory where where I mean you've been fishing there all your life and you can't fish everything in a lifetime. Can no. You? no, you can't. You can't fish it all. I mean, Idaho, we're we're uh, there's so much water here. We're really lucky have so much water and then what where we sit we sit right in the corner of idaho wyoming and montana wyoming to our east and montana to the north we sit right in that corner and you know there's within three hours of us it's like you, there's no way you could fish it all in your life yeah, yeah. And that's a wonderful so. thing we gave it our best shot in five days but we didn't we didn't even come <laughs> close <laughs> right yeah i mean we fish we guide three rivers in our area, and Idaho is very unique. Idaho is very restrictive on guiding, so we can only we guide three different rivers. But there's lots of creeks and other smaller rivers that aren't permitted to guide that we don't even guide on. But we guide three rivers, and each of them have about 60 miles of water, and yeah. we guide over 30 different sections that average like eight miles long. And how many um, guides do you have on your team? We've got 30 guides. The guide for us. Wow. That's that's absolutely, and you've got thirty guides that can spread out all over the area and not fish the same water twice in a. I mean, that's just that's a lot. That's a lot of fish. We're really lucky, and we have and the fishing is great, and we've got great conservation groups like the Henry's Fork Foundation and the South Fork Initiative and the Friends of the Teton that do amazing work. To uh, I mean, the rivers are in the best shape maybe they've ever been in ever since before humans came here you know well that's one of the interesting things is we we did a small feature on friends of the teton when we were there with you brian and uh talking to anna one of the things that struck me as as fantastic is that they've been able to reach out to ranchers and farmers and business people all within the teton valley and they've all, they all realize the importance of that one specific river. I'm not talking about the snake. I'm not talking about the Henry's Fork of the snake. I'm talking about the Teton River proper and the drainage system that comes through there. And in, in, in a world where not many people will, are willing to work together to better something, everybody's come together 
with Friends of the Teton to better it. And there was a new state record caught this summer. It was a 30 and a half or a 31 and a half inch pure strain cutthroat. That's incredible. Yeah, pretty awesome. That was one, one of our guides that caught that. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, Nathan Burr, his name. Yeah. It's, well, it, was, it was amazing. But yeah, the, 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 they've done an amazing job. The people, you know, the ranchers, the landowners, the uh, newcomers, anybody, guides, whoever, it, it's just a great uh, network of people that realize how important the resource is. And everybody loves it. They may love it in different ways and for different reasons, but yeah, uh, they all yeah, see the importance not, of it. Yeah, and do not rob me. Uh, one of the guests on tonight said, and it's not all private land which is fantastic. Idaho, you know, in your region, it is, you know, you can get out, you can wade, you can, you can get out and fight your fish if you want. It's not all private land, is it? Yeah. Well, it, there's uh, Idaho has a ton of public land. I think one of the highest percentages of public land in the country or in all of the United States. Uh, but also we've got really good uh, public access uh, laws. So like some places, you know, you can't get out, on the you know, landowners on the bottom of the river in Idaho, it's a high water mark. So if, right. even if you're flowing through private land, the water is uh, public right away. So right, right, right. Yeah. That's and that's fantastic. That's just that's absolutely fantastic. So when we arrived on day one at Teton Valley Lodge, um, our guide Chris Scott came up and introduced us at the, at the breakfast table, and he said, "You know what? Just relax. We're going to hop out. We're going to jump." Into, the, into these really cool little boats and we're gonna fish right in front of the lodge. And I'll be honest with you, Brian, my heart sank. I was like, oh, really? They gave us this guy and we're just gonna go, we're, we're gonna cast off the, off the front dock? Like this really? is what we're in for? And I'm here to tell you that we had one of the most unbelievable experiences that I have ever experienced fishing three miles above and below, not even three miles, one mile above and below the lodge, head hunting for cutthroat. Yeah. Want to see a bit? Oh, sure. Yeah. Take a look at this. You see these little clear spots on the bottom where you can see clear gravel. Those are some of the only spots through here that fish can sit in one spot and feed. So when I can find one that's in a spot like that, I can pretty much guarantee that when our flies get there, he's still going to be there, you know, which helps us out a lot. Otherwise, they're moving around a lot, and you really got to get a cast that's close to them in order to get them to eat. Otherwise, your fly will just go through there, and, and they just happen to be off to one side or the other eating something else. It's nothing you're doing wrong. It's just a rhythm thing. So this is a really interesting fishery here, whereby each of these fish has his own attitude and his own personality. And so as we go from one feeder to the next hunt, hunting them, we get to watch each individual and decide what they're doing, how they're working, if they're happy or sad or agitated or otherwise, and then make adjustments accordingly. It's pretty fun. Every, every minute's different, every fish is different. It changes hourly and we get to change with it. It's pretty fun stuff. That's a good fish, that's a happy fish. Yeah. Nice. Ooh. Might have been a hair close to him that time. Let's just let it go and see. See how his his mannerism and body language changed right as the flies landed? Yeah. He moved a lot more water. Take him. Yeah. Strip, strip, strip. Yeah. That's a big fish, man. Nice. We watched this fish from yards up. That's a beauty. Feeding and getting happy. That's a beauty. And I thought I screwed up the cast by putting the fly too close to this. Oh my gosh, what a gorgeous cutthroat. Look at that thing. Trophy cutthroat on the Teton River. Look at that. Oh, big down. fish, man. Oh man, look at this one. There we go. Big wild cutthroat. Great job, Mark. Well, you made some improvements to your cast and got the flies turned over perfectly. I'll tell you, well, we, we laid it in a little too close to him there at first and he spooked for a second. I thought he wasn't gonna come and grab it, but you did a good job to leave it there and let him come and take it. 
Great job. And that was just day one. So, <laughs> so the cool thing about this technique is it's all visual. It's sight casting. You have to place that precision cast right in the wheelhouse. But there's one thing that makes this fishery possible, and it's the boats. Yeah, the boats. The coffin boats. They're, can you tell us a little bit about, about what they are and where they came from? So I don't know 100% where they came from. Uh, other than just, I mean, it's a long time ago, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, so when, they, when my great-grandpa started guiding, uh, one of the things that they used to do was trap. That was uh, a way that they sustained themselves. And, uh, you know, drift boats, they'd never seen a drift boat, you know, <laughs> in 1920 in Teton Valley, I don't think. And uh, that, that's the boats they had. That's all they had. So that's what they used. They used them. They used to use them to they'd fill them up with pelts and uh, uh, traps and whatnot. And they'd be able to pull them. You know, we use those uh, lodge poles to uh, maneuver the boat. And they would pull them up the sloughs and the creeks to gather up, uh, you know, muskrats and beavers and whatever pelts they were getting and uh so that's what they used to guide out of and uh lucky for us it just happens to be the best uh kind of boat to fish out there so even though you know we use other boats drift boats rafts whatever different kind of boats in other places uh we after 100 years we still use those out there and they uh they work better than anything else i don't know i don't know that they would work many other places no uh, but out there they're fantastic well, they're stable, they're long, they're, they're like 18 to 20 feet long. Yeah. Um, they're flat bottom, so they're completely maneuverable. And yeah. that whole system that Chris Scott was using that your guides use allows yeah. him to speed up and slow down the drift based on where you can see that fish eat. So if you see a fish eat river right and you're on river left, you know, he just drops the poles. It's basically silent and he yeah. can maneuver his way over there put you in the right position to make that precision cast. Now we had a unique experience such that it was um, day one. And I, I, and I'm not a numbers guy, but I mean, we were hitting fish all day. It was, and that was the big one. That was 20, 21 inch pure strain cutthroat. It was, it was a fantastic fish. Yeah. It's really, so your, your uh, apprehension when you first saw that you were going out there for a newcomer to the lodge, oftentimes, that's a, a reaction people have. Right. They, they don't understand. When you look out at it, because it's very slow, calm, mossy water, it kind of looks yep. almost stagnant to yep. you if you're, if, you're, if you're not trained in what it is. And uh, I have to, we have to remind people, say, well, you know, there's a reason they built the lodge right here. Because <laughs> it's a really good spot. So, uh once you're out there, it, in fact, people ask all the time, probably the number one question, well, one of the top three questions is, what's your favorite place to fish? And uh, I, it's an easy, mine is always to fish right out front of the lodge. It's my favorite place. It's crazy. It's absolutely yeah. crazy. We're fishing, we're fishing drakes. We're fishing dries. Um, mm -hmm. We have a question from Jeff Kempa um, who asks, uh, is, is, your, is your fishery being – you know, Henry's Fork, the South Fork of the Snake, the, the Teton River, is it primarily a dry fly, dry fly fishery? What, what's the seasons like? What are the seasons like? So, um, I don't know. It's not primarily. As, it depends on what season you're talking about, right? So, the summertime, it's a fantastic dry fly fishery. I'll tell you that. Um, we have tremendous hatches on all three rivers. So, uh, what, what, you want me to go through the hatches or, or a, like a timeline of when those hatches happen? What do you want me to talk about? Mark? The timeline, Brian, because, because it's, it's news to okay. me. We were there, you know, first, second week of September, right sure. with when the, uh, um, the mutant stoneflies were going off. Yeah, um, so I would love to hear more about your rivers and, and what happens. You know, I know that the Henry's Fork is famous in the spring for those big salmon flies, right? So what's, oh, yeah. what's the scene? All right. So, well, okay, we're starting out a new year. So starting out January through the winter, um, you know, uh, like yesterday it was 20 below zero. Uh, it's a little chilly right now. I drove over the South Fork today. It's full of ice. <laughs> so 
in the winter time it it's hit and miss depending on the weather if the weather's good uh streamer fishing in the winter always so i would say january till oh you know end of march first of april is when it's dead of winter uh streamer fishing primarily there's some good nymphing uh on the henry's fork and the and the south fork the teton is uh, not really that fishable uh, in the middle of winter right now it's completely frozen like if you went out where that video was right now it's like a skating rink it's you could right. almost drive your car across it but uh then in april is kind of when winter kind of loosens up a little bit uh the henry's fork uh will get really good nymphing and you'll start to have end it into april you'll start having a lot of blueing olives uh really some really good blueing olive hatches um still some midges that will happen in the winter blueing olives the south fork gets really good on streamer fishing and uh you'll get a huge uh the water starts to rise and you'll get a huge uh worm uh bite they'll start eating san juan worms like unbelievable over there and uh, also uh, rubber lake stonefly nymphs and um in April and then May comes around then you start getting some more hatches and the south the south fork not so much the, the Teton will you'll start to get some caddis depending on uh, how the runoff comes down but the Henry's fork in Mar May gets a huge Mother's Day caddis hatch really good dry fly fishing especially on the lower river um, and then uh, and you'll and you'll still have blueing olives coming off and then uh, the stone flies start moving on this Henry's Fork in May, and uh, you'll get, uh, you know, a massive stone fly hatch, salmon fly hatch coming off, uh, give or take a week before Memorial Day till Memorial Day is when it'll kick off on the bottom river and then move up the canyon. Um, and it's, it's awesome. It's fantastic. It's, the best is when you have high water on the Henry's Fork. The Henry's Fork sits in a giant volcano, which is the old caldera of Yellowstone, uh, the like the second or third uh, last uh, eruption of Yellowstone. So you don't have, even though it's at a really high elevation and you get a ton of snow, you don't have high runoff on that river because it's full of, it's just a giant sponge that soaks up the water. So the, at that time of year, the Henry's, or the Teton and the South Fork are both kind of in uh, runoff mode and they get really muddy no hatches going off on those that time of year through uh june typically uh because of runoff but the henry's fork you have so you, you'll have a, a mother's day caddis hatch then you'll have the salmon fly hatch and then you get uh that goes through oh like the 10th of june 10th 15th of june you'll have salmon flies and golden stones and then about the 15th of June in there, you get really good PMD hatches on the Henry's Fork. And uh, then you get, if you're lucky, not every year, but uh, like the last two or three years, probably the best fishing I've seen in my entire life on the Henry's Fork with green drake hatches. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. In like the, the 20th of June through the end of June. And you'll still have golden stones out uh, all over the South Henry's Fork. And then uh, right about the end of June, if it's early, it'd be the 20th of June. If it's late, it'd be like the 10th of July, uh, depending on snowpack and flow. Then you're going to start having uh, hatches on the Teton and the South Fork. The water will clear up, uh, uh, water temperature will come up, and you'll have salmon flies on both those rivers, the South Fork and the Teton, and uh, green drakes, PMDs, yellow sallies, uh, caddis. I mean, just like crazy it's yeah it just goes off the, the henry's fork kind of wanes on the hatches in july uh and the and the teton and the south fork take off um mm -hmm. and they'll run more water out of this henry's fork a lot of times in july for uh for uh uh irrigation and the, the hatches just kind of wane a little bit up there but the teton and the south fork kick off and go crazy with all those different bugs and they fish really good. The Henry's Fork still fishes, but not as much dry fly action. Right, right. And then that that goes on. The South Fork and the the, Henry, the salmon flies will end somewhere around the 10th, 15th, sometimes as late as the 20th of July, uh, depending on the runoff. But mm -hmm. then uh, you get a huge golden stone hatch on the South Fork, massive. 
and massive PMD hatches on that and on the Teton, along with yellow sallies. And July is that's prime time. It's you know everybody. It's it's busy. The river's busy. People are fishing. It's it's good fishing. Riffles and banks, and backwaters and everything. Um, and then August comes along, and you move into more hopper time. Uh, the 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 stone flies are kind of waning, uh, and the hoppers are out all over the place. Terrestrials, um, and that gets really good on the Henry's Fork as well. As, and, and, and on the Teton and South Fork. And you still have PMDs and uh, like uh, Sulphurs and, and uh, Hendrix and, uh, and there's still Caddis also. And then you get into the end of August or middle to end of August, you get the mutant golden stones on the South Fork, the nocturnals that come out. That's what we experienced when we were there. And it was just, I mean, yeah, oh gosh, it was lights out. Yeah, it's really, it's really, it's awesome. It's really good. They eat the, they, they eat the stones underwater, like the rubber legs, you know, or girdle bugs yeah. on the bottom, but then they also eat the dries and they don't have, the wings don't fully develop on their back and the, the bugs, they skitter on the water to, instead of flying from uh, out to lay their eggs, they'll skitter out and uh, yeah, the fish just, they kill them. Um, but then, uh, so it's mostly hoppers and uh, some uh, mayflies through uh, uh, August and September. And then uh, streamers start kicking in. And then as the weather cools off, depending, sometimes, you know, end of October, September into October, it's 80 degrees. Sometimes yeah. it's snowing a little bit and cool. And yeah. if you get that cold uh, weather, then you'll get really big uh, bluing olive hatches on, right. uh, on all the rivers. And then it goes into streamers and, and uh, maybe – yeah. yeah, yeah, and then and then it's uh, just go fishing. <laughs> yeah, you know one of the, one of the great things about what we were doing there is is as I mentioned, we were guided by Chris Scott, uh, who's been a guide at, at TVL for twenty plus years. Yeah. Um, super fishy, super confident, and uh, and and it, uh, he's inventive. He yeah. likes, he loves to play. He loves to try different things. And one of the, and I'm not going to give, I'm not going to give your dad's secret away. I promise you that. But <laughs> we were fishing a foam fly, which was probably the biggest terrestrial I've ever fished in my life. Yeah. And it was a foam fly that was an inch and a half to two inches long yeah. and cutthroat and hybrids were killing it. A yeah. giant giant fly and um again i'm not going to give your dad's secret away but it was i mean <laughs> it was the stuff that dry fly dreams are made of yeah well that's one of the things that makes this area uh really unique is the the great opportunities for dry fly fishing i mean there's a lot of great places to catch fish yeah. uh we're really lucky uh but that the dry fly fishing is so consistent for us Right. So I've got a clip of, um, to, to set this up, Chris, we're on, on, um, the South Fork of the Snake just below Palisades Dam. Uh -huh. And he, he keeps telling me that this is a big fish factory. It's a big fish factory because they can't push up any further and all the scuds and all the, all the, uh, bait fish that get churned up in the, in the turbines, they just come and they just feed the whole time. Right. Yeah, yeah. So he throws on this giant terrestrial, rows out into the middle of the river and says, there's a shelf here. Watch this. <laughs> yeah, so looking down, you see the shelf showing up here in the middle. So we're gonna fish it off the right of us. I'll start slowing us down. We'll just set up a drift over there to the right of us. Yeah, somewhere out in there. Take him, nice. just like that. Nice. To the dry, that's right. That's fantastic. That is absolutely amazing. Good fish too, man. I hope we got all that. Yep, so now once he's in the net, okay, Sweet. you can hold on to him. I got him. So what we're doing is we're actually gonna move over so we don't blow over all this water. Um, and then we're gonna let this fish go and we're able to keep fishing. That fly just popped right out. That's awesome. Good. Should That's actually right here. It's pretty fish. damn good. All right, so we pulled over to the side so we can look at this fish safely. And, to get, and to get a fish of this quality on a surface fly, Unbeatable, unbeatable, yeah, just yeah. perfect.
Guys dialed in, man. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's- he, he, not Dave. he told me that later. He's like, that's Dave. I see him like <laughs> twice a week. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's awesome. I'm kidding. Uh, no, and 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 the South Fork of the Snake is is such a fantastic fishery, um, but it is controlled by the dam, yep. right? And it does fluctuate throughout the year as to um, you know water flows. And and what I love about it personally is I've fished it probably 15 times in my career, and every time I fish, you know, Twin de Lorenzo or whatever it is. It, it, it's a it's it's a completely different fishery. It changes yeah. almost by the week. Yeah, I mean it, it's a it's it. You never get bored at all, do you? No. No. The cool thing about the South Fork and uh, uh, especially maybe all I, I I'd say that on all the all our rivers, but uh, the South Fork is really big, and uh, you can t- it it gets pressure. You know, I mean it's. 2020 2021 almost there's a lot of people fishing uh there's uh but it's you don't even hardly notice it on the south fork it's so big and the other amazing thing is pretty much the entire thing is fishy you don't go through frog water or areas that are dead it's cast there turn around cast there you gotta you gotta you got a grassy bank, then you got a cliff, then you got a backwater, then you got a riffle, then you got a little channel, then you got a flat, then you got, it's just, it's endless over there. It's, there's fish everywhere. It's awesome. It, it, it is, it is endless. And, and with hybrids, browns and pure strain cutthroat, you, you've got opportunities to fish different styles as well. Yep. I was really excited to see how pumped Chris was when we came to this, this drop off that he hadn't been able to fish all season because the water had been ripping through yeah. and you know, the water had dropped enough that we were able to, to anchor up. He was able to dress some flies and in, in a way that, that he actually goes through on the TV show he, reluctantly. He didn't want to sh- tell his secret, but he did it anyway. <laughs> um, and we, we walked out to this drop off and we lit it up and in seven casts we landed three big brown trout and lost two so it's you know to see the guides be excited about the fishery after 20 years and and what that south fork of the snake offers is unique and i've got a little clip here to show um just to show how excited chris gets about about what he does that's awesome There he is. There Just he is. Like big that. brownie. Big brown. Big one. Let him run, buddy. Atta boy. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, that is a huge brownie. Oh, my brown God. Woo hoo hoo. <laughs> so, cover water. Oh, my gosh. I don't even know what to say. Man, he's still in charge. Large and in charge. Just keep walking down the shelf. Got him. Got him. Sweet. What a fish, man. Nice fish. What a fish. What a technique. What do you eat? The drown or the uh, pe- uh, the rubber legs? The rubber legs. How do you like that? There you go. Huh? Huh? <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. What a fish. What a fisher. Big old fins, fins yeah. on him, huh? Pretty. Got a little adipose going. Yeah, yeah. Got teeth on him too. Yeah, he does. Big mouth brownie. Yes, what sir. a beauty. Thank you, sir. Good what job. What a great technique. Right on. Tons of fun. When you approach a situation like this, usually the most aggressive, biggest fish is gonna be the first one to charge the fly and eat it. So it's really important that your first cast or two is on point and your men's are good and your tension's right so you can hook them. So you can't be too casual about the first two casts. It's really important. Focus, get a good drift, watch your indicator. Because like you saw, that was his first cast in, that, in this spot. And I'm really happy that he was ready to go. Great job. See? Yep. The, the ultimate educator. All he cares about is, 
is putting you on these giants. Yep. And he actually, I hate to say it, but he seems to enjoy it more than the actual angler does sometimes. Yeah, we we uh, we've got really great guides. Uh, that's uh, something that uh, we've always really strived for was to uh, have great guides. And I often tell people. Uh, our customers, when I'm introducing them or they're new to us, I'm like, you're going to go with Chris, you're going to go with Tom, you're going to go with whoever you're going to go with. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll ask me about them. I'll say that they they probably want to catch fish more than you do. <laughs> they're going to yeah. be there. That's all they care about. Well, one of the things that I also love about your, your style, and it is family style. Your lodge is very family style. I mean, we all eat together. We all hang out together. You know, it, it, it's it's absolutely fantastic, but your job interview process for your guides is unique. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Because you don't sit them down, do you? No. Well, you talk to people. I mean, people call you and tell you they want to work or be a guide, whatever. But uh, uh, anybody will tell you that they fish a lot and that's all they live for and they've, you know, all that stuff. The only way you really know is taking fishing. So we go out and float the river and, and uh, spend a day on the water and see how they do well he did fine <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's, great. he's been there 20 years yeah Chris, and there's a lot of Chris, education Chris that goes great. with it too um brian before i get into the education there's a question from um from i lost it the question is basically um oh it's from richard um are there any changes for the lodge coming in 2021 uh, yeah, we do have some changes going on. We're doing a, we're doing a bunch of cabin upgrades right now to the lodge itself. We're doing, uh, we're the boat house where those uh, Teton boats were located that you went out of. Uh, mm -hmm. we've uh, actually torn down the old one and we're, re we're building a brand new one right now. And, uh, but, uh, as far as the fishing and the guiding and all that stuff goes, not really everything that way will be the same. Uh, we're building a bunch of new boats, uh, to be ready to go, time flies, doing it same same as always that way. That's fantastic. That's absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. So I talked about the education, or I talked about the the interview process of the guides, um, but really when they're on the water, they're educators. And mm -hmm. I didn't realize that Chris had did this, had done this, but I was out fishing off this ledge, and he pulled my camera guy aside and said, "Hey, I've got something to tell your audience. Take a look at this." Okay. We're down on the south floor today. It's getting into autumn, and we have a, a rare treat today. Uh, on the rock right here in front of me are little nymphal shucks of a certain kind of stonefly that hatches only at this time of year down here. You can see there's a big gravel bar behind me. There's a lot of big gravel bars out here on this stretch. As the water drops and exposes these rocks, these stoneflies hatch. These are a special uh, smaller golden stonefly. They're actually kind of gray in color and they're what we call a mutant. They, they don't have wings. So that makes for great dry fly fishing out here because since they can't fly, they just skitter across the surface and drive trout absolutely nuts. So we're gonna have the opportunity today to tuck a big rubber-legged dry fly into these fast banks and these flats and all over and twitch it and skitter it around a lot and get these fish up to eat it. We just came through the first little stretch of bank from the put-in. We've gone a few hundred yards and we've had like a dozen fish take the dry fly already. So uh, this is only going to get better. Come on, let's roll. <laughs> the guy makes me laugh. Come he, on, let's roll. He eats it up. It's all he thinks about. It's all he does. So It is. Yeah. It absolutely is. Um, yeah. And, he, know, and he's good know, at it. You know you got a good guide when they guide – 100, 130 days a year, and they go 10 or 20 days in a row, and they get a day off, and they go fishing. Yeah, on the day off. That's exactly that, right. You know, you got a good guy when that happens. That's what they're. So doing. that mutant stonefly hatch is really interesting because it's a nocturnal event. So, yeah. admittedly, I didn't, I didn't get an opportunity to see any of these flies. I didn't get to see any of them on the on the surface of the water. But in the first and second week of September, you've got that mutant stonefly hatch that happens in the in the in the overnight, right? And then the fish are dialed in on those, but yep. then they switch over back to hoppers. I mean, you can literally fish dries all day long. Is that unique to the South Fork? Uh, I don't know if they have those any other place. To tell you the truth, I don't. I've never heard of it uh, anywhere else. But uh, uh, 
I, don't, I, I can't. I can't answer that. I don't know. Right. We don't. And, and we don't, we don't get them on the Teton or the Hendricks Fork. Right. And and in all honesty, um, if you're going to go during that time, be prepared that between you know eleven o'clock and twelve thirty. This was my experience. That things got really quiet. It's almost. It's almost like they needed a moment to switch over from the mutants to say, "Hey, it's hopper time now." Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is interesting. Now we had yeah. one fish that was remarkable. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Do you have oh no, you're good. There? No, you're you're good. We had one fish that that was remarkable to me, um, and it was right after that lunchtime period, after the switchover from the mutant stones to the hoppers, where we caught a brown trout that was 22 and change inches long, uh, that was sipping hopper sipping terrestrials in literally six to eight inches of water. It was absolutely crazy. That yeah. river has the opportunity to fish a variety of different th different styles in September, doesn't it? Oh yeah, well, and all year long, really, you could fish, uh, you know, you can fish deep. There's th that, that river, like you said, that big fish you caught, you catch them in, I mean, sometimes you catch them in a foot of water. Yeah. And, and there's holes on the South Fork that are 30 feet deep. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, so you could fish the water column in a million different places, right? And there's fish throughout the river. Yeah. So you can, you can fish it in a variety of different ways on the same day and have success in a bunch of different ways. You want to see that fish? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Here we go. to be kidding me. Are you actually kidding me right now? Don't move, don't move. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Oh, oh. no way. No way. <laughs> oh man. No Look way. Look at this guy. I'm just kind of sitting here watching him. I don't, I don't even want to touch him. I'm just checking him out. Like, look at this guy. Oh my God, he hurts you. Yeah, it's fine. Good, I'm, good. I'm bleeding. It's a little, all good. A little blood's good. What an absolute stud brown trout. Look at that thing. I'm I'm completely in awe. Um, what a fantastic fish. What a special moment. That Look was... at the size of its adipose fin. And he barely moved any water when he ate it. He just came up, slurp, fly was gone. Wow. Oh my God. The blue on its cheek. What a thrill. What an absolute thrill. All Back right. to get even bigger, right? <laughs> <laughs> Look at him. Wow, what a tank. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's I know that spot. I know exactly where you're at right there. I, I don't often float past that spot without fishing that bank and catching fish. That 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 flat. My dad used to. I can remember being when my dad was training me, float down the river, and uh, he would make you repeat. Browns love shelves. Browns love flats. He'd make you say that because everybody wants to fish that left bank that's bushy and overhang whatever, and then that. Right bank is flat and shallow, and you don't think they're in there, but that's they love those spots. Yeah, it, it was eight inches of water, and I have a confession to make. Chris caught that fish. I didn't because I was looking at a bunch of diving bergansers, yeah. and I was like, what are those ducks doing? And he said, set, 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 and I just reefed on it, yeah. right? I didn't even see the eat, and he said it was just a tiniest little sip. So yeah. hats off, man. Chris caught that fish. It wasn't me. Well, that's good. You said it. A lot of times you tell your customer, take them, take them, take them, and they, they don't do anything. They say, are you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> now, I want, to go, I want to go back a little bit to um, the Teton River proper. Yeah. So where your lodge is located, mm -hmm. just outside of Driggs, is that considered the lower Teton? No, we're at the upper. We're right at the headwaters. You're at the headwaters, and yeah. then where we were for the canyon, that's the yeah. lower. That's uh, we call that the Narrows. Narrows okay. of the Teton. 
Tell me a little bit about the Narrows and what it has to offer. So the Narrows is uh, like when you come to the lodge and you see the Teton River, you would never even ima- you, you you wouldn't imagine they're the same river. They're right. dramatically different, right? So uh, the river starts right here by the lodge, about a mile, two miles above the river. So it's a spring creek. It comes out of the ground in a hundred different little places. Crystal and, clear, crystal clear. clear water. Oh yeah, yeah, gin clear water. And then it runs down through the valley, through a bunch of oxbow area, through the through the Teton Valley, beautiful farmland and cattle land, whatever. And then uh, and then it drops into right at the end of our valley, it starts to go into the canyon, which is a volcanic canyon. I had a geologist, one of our customers, explain it to me that it's a the canyon wall is made out of uh, volcanic ash. It would have been, he, he explained it to me. He said it would have been like a giant wall of boiling hot shaving cream from right. a Yellowstone eruption that floated down and settled and made this wall. And it almost looks like Zion or, or Moab or something, the, the canyon wall. It's very deserty and red. A lot of it's red rock, uh, kind of looking like southern Utah almost. It doesn't look anything like up here. Um, and it's full of rattlesnakes. Uh, which there's not rattlesnakes really anywhere else in up in our area. Uh, but as soon as you get into that canyon, there's rattlesnakes. It's uh, it's a different area. The river flows, flows directly north through Teton Valley. And when it hits into the canyon, it makes a, almost a, a, a 90 degree turn to the left and heads west. So the, the north side of the canyon is directly south facing all year and gets, so it gets a lot of sunlight and it's very warm on that hillside. And uh, it used to be extremely wooded with uh, uh, all different kinds of trees, but pine trees and elms and cottonwoods and mahoganies and all sorts of stuff. But uh, uh, they decided to build a dam on that canyon in the 70s. And uh, they built the dam in uh, and uh, it broke in 1976 before they built the dam or as they were building the dam, they went down and they chopped down all the trees so that the reservoir wouldn't be full of uh, debris. They chopped down all the trees and hired a uh, tugboat to come up and uh, haul all the trees away, the logs away off the river as it filled up. And uh, uh, you can still see in some of the canyon, you can see some of the cables holding the trees together. But uh, uh, as they were trying to haul them out when the dam broke. But you'll be floating down the river, and there will sometimes be a giant stump that's sawn off with a chainsaw, like a five-foot-wide, six-foot-wide tree stump sitting in the middle of the river that you float over. And it used to be up on the canyon wall, but when the canyon was filled up with water and then broke, it was about 20 miles long, and it was 300 feet deep at the dam when it broke, and it collapsed the canyon walls as all that water rushed out and uh, filled the river up with uh, who even, I don't even know, millions of yards of dirt and rock and, and debris and changed the river forever. It's a completely unnatural river once you get to where the res- where the dam had the effect on it. Um, there's hardly any trees, uh, you know, compared to what it would be. And, right. and the river is filled in and all these where the where the rock slides happen, it created very large rapids in some places, which kind of acts like um, like a diversion dam, like you would see on on a on a on an irrigation uh, where where they put in a dam for irrigation. So you'll have all the rocks come in, and it makes a slower section of water, and then you'll have a big rapid as it goes over the da- over the dam or the rock slide, and then another slower spot. So it's like stairs going down. And uh, it's got very uh, little access. Um, there's only uh, uh, one or well, actually two roads into the whole canyon. Um, right. And uh, and it's there's a lot of rattlesnakes. It's hard access, and uh, and the rapids can be uh, pretty dangerous. So uh, it doesn't get a lot of traffic, uh, which is nice. And uh, but it's fantastic dry fly fishing and. And it's uh, one of the greatest cutthroat fisheries uh, uh, in the world that's left. So, 
Yeah, you know, we 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 were fortunate enough to fish it with Chris and um, pulled out a, t a ton of great fish. I'm not going to show you the big cutthroat that we caught. Uh, you'll have to see that in the show, but I do want to show you what the access was like. And you're not lying about rattlesnakes, man, because when that when that boat started to get repelled down that cliff, yeah. that raft, I I had to walk down. I was I was flying the drone to to shoot it, and I came across two just on the yeah. on the walkway down. I didn't see them. But they made themselves known for sure. So this yeah. here's an example of what one of these access. If you want adventure, <laughs> this is this yeah. is it. This is this perfect. High, it's high adventure. <laughs> <laughs> it's our final day fishing out of Teton Valley Lodge, and we make the decision to go to work. A short drive from the lodge finds you at a very different stretch of the Teton River, where access is a little dicey. Those who know me know that I'm a sucker for adventure. And you want to talk about adventure? We're about to drop this raft thousands of feet down into this valley. We're going to fish the Teton River today. And it's going to be absolutely incredible. You have to have good gear, right? Yeah, right. It's uh, it's it's and that and that video doesn't even do it justice. I know. So we have uh, we do that almost every day. We've done it for ever, and uh, but people will come and say, "I want to go do that," and you can kind of tell sometimes when it you know uh, maybe that guy shouldn't go down that hill. Yeah. Uh, because of their age or maybe they're not moving so good, but they really want to go. So I do my best to uh, explain how big the hill is. I mean, I say it's, I sell it to them. I'd say it's really big. I don't know if you want to go there and they'll insist on going. And then they come back to dinner that night and they'll, they'll say, you, you didn't tell me it was that bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tried. You just didn't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they they bill me they bill me they bill me as the adventure guy and the new fly fisher. They send me to Brazil. They send me to the Arctic. They send me to to the canyons now. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was it was right up there with one of the greatest fly fishing experiences I've ever had. It's intimate, um, as Chris says, it keeps the riffraff out uh, for for access. You know, we didn't see another another boat all day, yeah. which was great, and and the fishing was fantastic. Yeah, it's it's a really cool river. It's uh, you know, you don't catch, you're not going to catch the big fish that you catch on the South Fork or the Henry's Fork in there, uh, but you're going to catch cutthroat and you catch uh, nice sized fish for sure and uh, very good dry fly fishing and it's it's absolutely breathtaking, beautiful. You're right, and 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 the thing to point out is that once you're in the canyon, you're not getting out until you hit the you come to the no. pullout. It's no, it's canyon right. walls the entire way. Yeah, you're not getting out of there. Hike, hiking out of there is rough, and uh, and then once you get down in there a little ways further, I mean, you could hike up, but then you're just going to be in the middle of a potato field for you know, hours, ten miles. Hours. Or <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh it's remote. It's uh, it's a really cool place. So we're lucky to be able to fish it. It's it's remote, and what impressed me uh, the most was that Chris. Uh, kicked us out of the boat every rapid that we that he shot. Yeah. Uh, we took all our gear with us. Uh, we we port portaged around the rapids so that we were safe. Yeah. Um, and he put on a life jacket and and he shot all those rapids. So um, yeah. hats yeah. off to him for keeping us safe in such a, uh, a an interesting situation. Yeah, and you can. I mean, we float that every day. And there's times when you get a little. Uh, you, in, in, I mean, we've done it for decades. And uh, we've sunk many boats in there. It, it, it's uh, it's uh, even though even after you do it, in, uh, a lot of times you can uh, you can still get uh, in trouble down there. There's yeah. there's some pretty serious stuff in there. Yeah. So you've got uh, cutthroat and hybrids. Let's take a look at the big hybrid that we got floating through the canyon. Cool.
All right, let's take a look at this absolute stud hybrid. I am so pumped for this. Look at that guy. What a dandy. This fish. That's a champion. It's right absolutely there. giant. Yeah. For here, huh? What see, a fish. See those gases underneath here? Yeah. But he's a rainbow, you know? But yeah. he's got some, some cutthroat characteristics. And like this is a good one here. for this river? That's a good one, yeah. That's a really nice one. Yeah, that was a beauty. That's a beauty. You know, it's it's, it's not the biggest fish in, the, in, in, in Idaho, but for that section of the river, Chris was over the moon happy. And we yeah. caught another 20 plus inch cutthroat in, in that section as well too. Yeah. So you do have an opportunity to dance with giants. Yeah, you can catch some nice fish in there for sure. You get a, you get a nice average size for sure. It's a, and it's a lot of dry fly fishing, which is super fun. Right, right. So Brian, I got to ask you, when does your season start? Um, how can people get in touch? And uh, um, you know, how, how far out do they need to book? What do they need to bring gear wise? Um, fill us in on, on, on the dirty details. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we, uh, we start guide, we guide all year. The lodge itself doesn't open until uh, the 1st of May. Uh, but uh, that's kind of when the snow gets out of our valley and the fishing really kicks off, uh, uh, gets hot. So uh, we open up on the 1st of May, uh, and then we run clear through November um, uh, at the lodge, and we'll guide you around. But uh, as far as uh, what to bring and when to come, it just depends on what you, what kind of fishing you want to do and what river you really want to target. It's great fishing really the whole year, uh, the whole summer. Um, I mean, of course, it's fishing. There's slow days and there's hot days, but there's always uh, great fishing going on. Um, and uh, as far as what to bring, uh, you can bring everything you've got, or you can just come with your, uh, with, uh, the clothes on your back and we'll take care of you. We've got all the flies. We got all the rods. We got all the, everything you need. We can, we can outfit you and take care of you. No problem. Um, and, uh, the best way to get a hold of us is just go online, go on uh, t lodge.com or, uh, check us out on uh, Instagram or Facebook and, uh, send us a message or give us a call, uh, off of the phone number on the website and uh, we'll take good care of you. And uh, and as far as when to book, you got to book, it's it, last year, it's crazy with COVID, right? Yeah. COVID, the COVID world nuts. We thought we were going to have it. We could have been closed. We didn't know who knew, you know, it turned out we had the busiest season we've had in over a hundred years. So yeah. in uh, 2021, it looks like it's going to be even busier. So that's, you know, that's, that's a crazy thing across the fly fishing world is that yeah. everybody is rocking and rolling uh, yep. because of COVID, because fly fishing is the ultimate social distance ex uh, experience. Um, you're in the middle of nowhere by yourself yep. with one other person. And we've seen fly fishing, fortunately, oh. unfortunately, go like that. Right. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it's great. It's great. You get new people in the sport and people are finding out. And it's it's uh, it's fantastic. Uh, you know, you, you can't be selfish and want to think you want to uh, have it all to yourself. Uh, right. it, it belongs to everybody. And it's, it does. it's, uh, and, and the truth is the fishing in our areas, I don't know about everywhere else in the world, but in our area is better than it's ever been. Honestly, yeah. it's fantastic. And, uh, so to bring it on, let's, uh, it's going to be a great year. 2021 is going to be awesome. All right, for those of you who want to see the show, it airs uh, on our YouTube channel uh, Saturday, noon Eastern, uh, 9 a.m. Pacific. Uh, it's a 48 minute minute show. It's not a typical broadcast length, so you get all kinds of extras in that episode. And then it will be broadcast on Sportsman Channel Canada and World Fishing Network um, in the future. You can check your lo local listings for that. Brian, I want to take this opportunity to thank you very much for your time. I know you and Josel cherish your off time because you are run ragged all summer. Um, you're fantastic hosts. You have a fantastic fishery and an unbelievable lodge. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Mark. We loved having you guys and appreciate your welcome back anytime. All right. Well, we've got one more piece of video that I want to show you. As you may or may not know, uh, coming up is our very first episode on broadcast for the new fly fisher for this season. And I want to tease you with what you can expect coming up for this season.
Thanks, everybody. Good night. God, that was awesome. There were two fish fighting for it. Both came and broke the surface, and then this one just hammered the fly. Ready and go. Oh, wow. Nice. That is absolutely wicked. So Chris has spotted and got me into first fish. We've seen some others. We just saw six go by us. There he goes. That was outstanding. And you know the best part was getting them on a bomber. Like that was awesome. Took three or four casts, got it in there. Chris helped me, boom, fish on. It's a fish factory, it's a food factory. Um, there's a lot of different ways to fish the river. It's it's just cool. It's uh, you know, it's 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 a pretty amazing place. <laughs> How do you like that 22 inch brown trout on a pheasant tail waiting in Montana? Nice. All right, so we're hooked up here to a nice big brown trout. Browns are not the dominant species in the bighorn, but you do have a shot at catching them. And when you do get them, they're generally pretty big. And this one looks fantastic. Yeah! <laughs> Woo! I feel like that. <laughs> what a fantastically large, aggressive wild brown. Adam had me thrown into the back, slowly stripping, and then dropping it off the legs. We saw the fish roll up even behind it. We slowed down the presentation and smashed. Big old smallie. Oh my gosh, it's a giant. That's a tank. This is the reason we make the drives. This might be my personal best, boys. That might be my personal best. He's got it. Oh Sweet. Big fish. How's that? It's a big pike. That is a monster. Oh my goodness. Yes! Can you believe this? That is a big pike. Thanks, sweetheart. What an unbelievable animal. Rob, is that your biggest northern? That is my biggest northern. Congratulations, Thanks, buddy. Thanks, man. Ah! That's a stud. Nice fish. That's a big fish, That's man. That's a nice one. Nice. You just said, too. We're going to pull a big one out of here. Yeah, we're going to find another nice one right, right in here somewhere. All right. There he is. Pretty good. What a dandy out here. Yeah.